episode off this week with Sabir. In today's hot seat is Paul Bellows. Paul Bellows is the uh, president and co-founder of Yellow Pencil. Since 1996, his team has designed and built digital platforms and worked alongside public sector clients and public governments and agencies to develop the operational maturity and cloud infrastructure that power exceptional uh, experiences and service journeys. Paul thinks deeply about the organizational uh, city, citizen experience design and technology aspects of digital government, uh, focusing on transformation and systems thinking. Paul, welcome to the show. Hey, Sabir. It's really great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So governments are very interesting, right? Um, I mean, before we jump into talking about government, uh, you've been at this just before we went live I, in the green room. You told me you've been doing this for 25 years, right? Yeah, my company so, just had our 25th birthday just this this last month. So it's exciting. So given that fact, like, I'm sure that you have gone through an incredible journey taking governments where I remember 25 years ago, uh, you know, whenever you went to the like the Department of Motor Vehicles to get your license. I'm, I'm in New yeah. York. You're in Canada. Yeah. I'm sure it's similar, right? Uh, that everything was paper based. Everything you had to stand in line. You get a little ticket to stand in line. No QR codes, no websites. Information was like sparse and you had to get people. So you've been through an an exciting evolution of seeing these governments go from paper to digital, right? So tell me about the beginning, at the very beginning, Paul, when he was a young buck. <laughs> so severe, like I, I had this belief at one point that I was going to be a professional musician. You know, I was going to be a singer songwriter and I was going to go do my thing. Um, and so I was write, writing songs and I was touring. I even got a label down in Seattle and I got signed and I had all these things happening. And along the way, I had to learn to promote myself, right? I had to learn how to build websites and things. These are like this is like 93, 94. So it's some of it's even pre-web. It's like internet, but you know, like we're back in like, you know, I'm, I'm FTP telling FTP servers. Into, yeah, right. Like, oh, even pre-FTP, like we're telling it again and putting stuff, you know, like pine emails, like early, early days. That's how I used to communicate with venues and book shows. And I learned a lot about publishing for for web. And and then, you know, as it became clear to me just how long a shot a, a successful career in music can be, I thought I probably need to take some of these skills I've developed and maybe build my side hustle. So, so the digital stuff was my side hustle while I was a musician for, for a long time. And then there was this one fateful day where my label called me and they're like, hey, good news. Uh, we got picked up by Sony. So we're going to we're going to go big time. Right. And say, but they can only bring the artists on our roster. We're going 100 percent full time music. you got to quit all your side jobs. And I was starting to have some success with the digital work, right? Like we were, I was, I was making some money and things were happening. It was starting to become more of a full-time job. And I just thought, you know what? I love music. I can always play music, but as a career, I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. And that's, that's really when I went full-time into digital and said, I'm, you know, I'm building a business. I'm going to grow this thing. I'm going to build a staff. We're, we're going to get good at this. Cause I was actually starting to have a lot of fun with it. So I went from, uh, I went from rock and roll to digital platforms for government pretty quickly at, at that point and, and uh, said goodbye was to the that label. But yeah. What was that the lane you selected in the very beginning and said that you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna digitize uh, these governments that's that's the service I'm gonna provide. Well, I when I started I was doing anything for anyone who would pay me a dollar, right? That's how we all started <laughs> business. Like I was hustling yeah. for anything. Just freelancing. But, yeah, yeah. So just freelance. It was just me to start. I was you know I had a I had a Mac laptop in 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 my in my apartment and I was working from the desk in there it was it was my everything room the laundry was next door the tv was over here this is the kitchen and this was my office and I could see it all at the same time but you know the the thing that got me really early in the 2000s was I just and it wasn't for any particular reason right it just seemed like the right thing to do but I got really interested in accessibility and the web to say hey you know, you can build this thing so that only like the latest and greatest browsers and only the, you know, like certain folks and we can make this highly visual and, you know, but I, I just kind of got interested in the idea of just open publishing and open formats and accessibility is a big part of that. Mm. And that became really, that was important to governments, right? Like one of the fundamental things, like one of the differences as a, if you sort of pretend that government is a business and it's not, it's something else, but if you pretend it's a business for a minute, and you say, what's the difference between a traditional retail business and government as a business? Government doesn't get to say who their customer is, right? Their customer is everybody. 
you know, Apple can say this phone is just for so and so. Like this, like, it, it costs this much, and it's for this part of the market. We want that market to be as big as possible. But we're going to dial our our product for the customer that can afford it, that wants it, that needs the feature, and, and that's how you're successful. You pick focus. Government has to make sure that everyone has equal access. And so, because we were focused on accessibility, because we learned a lot about it, we started picking up government contracts. And as you get good at something, you do more of it. And we just more and more went. And it was probably about like seven or eight years ago that you know we were doing stuff for like Home Depot and other big organizations, some brand name retailers. We kind of said, you know what? Let's pick the one the one horse we're going to ride. Um, and so it was about seven or eight years ago. We said it's government, right? Like it's just what we know. It's what we like. It's what my people get out of bed for to say I'm doing social good. Like there's value beyond just a paycheck to the work that I do. Um, so it's just good for morale. It's, it's good for people believing in what they do. Um, and it's, it's a purpose driven uh, company. You know, we're, we're here to make government better at delivering services and delivering information. Uh, and that feels worth getting out of bed for most days. So what was that first? We all remember our firsts, you know? Yeah. So what was yeah. that first client government client? And, and what did you do for them? So the very first government client I had was around 1997. And up here in Canada, we just like we got NPR in the US, up here in Canada, we got a national broadcaster, CBC. So that's our public broadcaster. But in the province of Alberta, where I live, there's a unique public broadcaster called the CKUA Public Radio Network. It was one of the first broadcasters in North America. So it's well over 100 years old. Um, so early, early radio, it was associated with the university and, and then eventually became a government broadcaster and then eventually went fully nonprofit and kind of broke away from the government. That was just a so it's sort of a quasi government organization. Um, but they were looking to do like replatform. They got a big grant and they were going to do this whole streaming and they're going to do online donations. And they looked around and they knew me because I was a musician, because I'd actually had records on their on their, their network. And they knew me because I was one of the in the late 90s, one of the few companies in our community that was doing modern digital work. So they called me and they brought me in. They said, we want you to run this whole thing. So I got in deep and I started, you know, we learned early streaming technology, like very early real audio, real network stuff. We got in and looked at online commerce before almost anybody was really doing credit card transactions online. That was early, early days. You know, we didn't have PayPal back then. That, nothing existed. You were, you were literally talking to a bank and saying, do you have a way to take a payment from a website? And like, well, there's this guy in a department who has this technology and we think we can use it for that, right? So it was very, very early days, but we built that whole platform for them. It was about a year and a half long project. We won some awards and then immediately the local health authority who like is accountable for health service delivery in the region said, Hey, you come over here. We want you to deal with our publishing platform. We're trying to build like health information online. And that was about two years later. So that was around 1999. Uh, so I worked for them for a couple of years and built like virtual tours of hospital, worked with IBM and some big tech and, you know, like all this cool back then it was like Java, just in time Java tech technology. Um, so we built all these like images of like how to move to a hospital and wayfinding and, you know, like health information. And we're just trying to build this publishing hub. And so we built an early content management system and it was hand coded in house. Cause that's how you did it back then. You know, there, there weren't really commercial applications to buy for building these big platforms. So we did that. And, I, and after those two, I was sort of on contract inside the organization. I thought, you know, I'm going to have way more luck being outside of the organization because being inside of this organization, I'm part of the political structure, right? I'm part of the decision making. You're so kind of shackled. Yeah. You can't tell people what to do. You can't tell senior leaders what to do if you're three three levels down. That yeah. I need to be in a position where I can tell them what to do because I kind of know how this works and, and not a lot of people do. And so that's when I took Yellow Pencil and really became a proper company and started taking clients. I'd been a contractor really inside of organizations for a little while. So that was around 2001 when we really stepped out and said, okay, we're hiring people. We're going out of it. We're going to start building these platforms. Um, and the rest has been, you know, just a linear path to sometimes a lot of success and sometimes other things. Well, the, the thing is, when you're going through that journey, right, you make it sound simple, yeah. right? 2001 <laughs> is 21, 22 years ago, right? Yeah. And yeah. I'm sure that uh, if you remove that shirt, there are pretty deep scars. <laughs> I, what, one of the things I've said, I say to all my staff is I have learned nothing worthwhile through success. I've only learned worthwhile things through failure, right? So that's, I, th I don't think humans learn in other ways, right? That was, that went terribly. Let's never do it again. How do we never have that happen again? And that is, I think, the only way to really learn a permanent lesson is, as a person or as an organization.
Uh, I mean, this morning, it's it's funny, uh, you, you mentioned that I, I was talking to my client, and I w I'm helping her uh, grow, double her business, right? Yeah. And she's very happy. She's very happy. Uh, you know, she got on there and said, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you, you're genius. This is the next message that I sent to her on, we were on Google Spaces, like a Slack, right? Yeah. I said, ego check. Mm -hmm. That's what I responded, ego check. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because uh, the thing is, some of those things, when you have too much success, it go goes to your head. And then Absolutely. even the stuff that made you successful, you're going to fail miserably because of the ego issues. Right. But if you take a pause and go like, OK, uh, great, it worked. How did it work? Let me see yeah. how I can dissect this and figure yeah. out the parts that actually worked and the parts that really sucked. Even with success, there are parts that are horrible. It just fails. But yeah. the thing is, the bigger success story is kind of cushioning the, the failures in there. You need to really separate the real true success in the experiment and then say, OK, you know what? That worked. I'm going to take that all the way through. This yeah. other part, I noticed that we have a problem. We need to fix that. Right. So I celebrated that with her with one text. Yeah. That was it. I nice. said, OK, That's now perfect. now we're going to go into it. Let me see. And I looked and I saw that there were three other things that need, still needed to be done. I said, it's good that you celebrate yeah. it. Thank you. It sounds yeah. great. Let's move on. These are three, this is the next three to do's you need to do, you know, <laughs> stop what celebrating. Is, yeah. One of the things is true about like our species, the kinds of like the way this little faulty walnut up here actually works is we're always scanning for safety, right? Like modern cognitive theory says the human being is just like, am I safe? Am I safe? Am I safe? And when you are safe, the brain starts to relax. Okay. I'm good right? And when you're in danger, the brain activates. So failure activates the what's going on, how do I get out Defense. of danger, whereas success shuts down your cognitive process. You're like, okay, it worked, I'm good. But what you did is what's essential, you got to have the same level of you know, analysis when it does and doesn't work, because half the time success or failure is luck, right? Yeah. And you can't tell. Was it that I did everything right? Or did the customer just want to buy what I was selling or want this to succeed in some way? You know, and, and unless you're really introspective and you ask the hard questions to both success and failure, you're not really learning anything. But it's yeah, I mean, is there, I mean, there's sometimes it's like nothing to do with you, man. It's just environment. Yeah. Right now yeah. in, in the U.S., there's Prime Day going on for two days, right? Right. Yeah. And then you go like, oh, you know what? We, we put up that free shipping thing with $10 off and it's working gangbusters. No, yeah. people are out with their wallets, with their credit card in hand. They just want to buy. They're excited to buy right now. That's what yeah. they're doing has nothing yeah. to do with you. You're not a genius. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, w one thing that when my, when I work with, I don't know if the same applies to you, but uh, when I work with my clients, they get excited because they're seeing amazing results, right? But then yeah. I, I go like, okay, that sounds good. Let's park it. Let's move to, because I already see these other things that we need to, because uh, I like the word momentum. Momentum is yeah. more important to me than anything yeah. else. I don't care about trending. I don't care about yeah. quarterly plans, annual plans. None of that is garbage. That doesn't work. Yeah. You know, if you miss the hour, you're going to miss the day, right? Yeah. You're going to miss this hour. You're going to miss the next one and the next one until you realize I'm missing the hours. Right. Yeah. But if you, if you are more, uh, if you are more truthful to yourself, go like, you know what? Uh, this doesn't sound right. You know, we're moving, we are losing our momentum. Yep. If you keep your momentum, then you're going to have an amazing day, right? Yep. And then you're going to have, if you have several of those, then you're going to have an amazing week. And yep. then if you have se several of those weeks, then your month. And then your CFO could be count the beans and say, oh, we, we did a fabulous job growing this business or growing this metric or giving money to Facebook and we got good returns from it, right? Yep. But if you missed that hour, you lost. You lost. I mean, yep. that's that's why I, I, I do an ego check. I go like, okay, you know what? Stop. Yeah. Let's go back to this. Some clients, they don't, they want to celebrate a little bit longer, but I go like, no, no, we, our, our time is precious. We need to, if you lose this momentum, uh, then we're going to, we're not going to be celebrating. We will be sorry uh, that yeah. we took time to do that. You know, the, another way to si describe what you said, just in, in a different model is lead indicators and lag indicators, mm -hmm. right? So like lag indicators, the thing you actually want to have happen It's the thing after like profit, right? You want profit in your company. I want my product to be profitable. I want my business to be profitable. I want my month of services to be profitable, but you can't directly impact profit, right? Because a whole lot of things need to happen 
so that you become profitable. If you're selling a service, you need to close the deal. You need to get acceptance to the scope of work. You need to deliver on the scope of work. You need to invoice the client. You know, all these things, they need to accept the work. You know, all these things need to happen. It's a product. You know, you need to, to design it, manufacture it, ship it, ship it at scale. All these things need to happen. Lead indicators are the early things you can pay attention to and that you can get your hands right onto. I can hold those levers. I can move them around. I can try different things. And lead indicators should produce lag indicators, right? So you're always looking for the thing right here that I can influence and measure directly, which should produce the lag indicator. And then you're constantly tweaking the lead indicators and working on that space. So like often I think what we think we're supposed to have, like everyone tells you, oh, you should be profitable in a company. Great. And that feels, so people come in and say, my strategy is to be more profitable. That's not a strategy. That's the outcome you want. That's the result you want. Your strategy, what levers am I going to pull? What's within my control where I can actually touch that? Can I improve? Can I train my staff? Can I you know, improve my knowledge outcomes? Can I shorten my sales cycle? Can I shorten my invoicing cycle? What are the things you can control? And then when you improve those things, that improves. And those are the day-to-day -day things, the hour-by-hour -hour things. That's actually where you need to be active in your business. Then you need ways to measure those lag indicators. Say, and did I get to the outcome I wanted consistently? And am I just constantly improving my, my, you know, my path towards those outcomes? So that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's sort of similar thing to what you said. One is like, what is the mindset of the entrepreneur? Then the other is, as you get into a big organization, you start to scale and a lot of people are involved. What can I measure that we can actually influence that will get us to the lag indicator, that later outcome that we actually want? So that's one of the things that you get to scale of like, yeah, you got to take that other. So it's exactly what you said, but there's that other mindset of lead and lag indicators. And like, you know, we can't always control the thing that we want to have happen, the actual end result directly. Mm -hmm. So what can we control and what can we influence that's within our, our sphere? So uh, you, you said something about measurement, right? When, yeah. you're, when you're running a retail organization or e-commerce, there are yeah. well-published KPIs, right? Everything from conversion rate, bounce rates, Google Analytics gives you a ton of data. Yeah. All sorts of things like that. And ultimately, is your business growing? You're looking at revenue uh, related metrics, right? Average order, average units, unit price, coupons used, yeah. stuff like that, right? Yeah. When it comes to a government and when you transform yeah. a government, how do you measure success? Is it engagement with your services? I mean, what, what, what is your POV on that? So there's going to be probably two big buckets. And one absolutely is engagement, right? Like, so you want to know, have we as a government organization operated in a clear and responsible and consistent manner such that we have developed the trust of the people who we are providing services to? Because beyond, you know, and, and just to sort of unpack, like government is a lot of different things. There's like a legislative part of government that makes laws and policies. There's like a regular, like a, a, a enforcement, you know, the, these are police, for instance, are part of like yeah. the enforcement parts. And then there's also the, the biggest part of government typically is service delivery. Government delivers a lot of services. And I know there's this mindset of we should have less government. And usually people are talking on the legislative side, right? The more the bureaucratic side. Mm -hmm. But fewer people say, I would like fewer well-paved roads. I would like fewer healthy, functioning public schools, educating the next generation <laughs> of entrepreneurs. I would like fewer healthcare services. You know, I've met Canada, so we're a little bit up here, healthcare is a little more public sector, <laughs> right? You know, so that, yep. that's my, my Canadian bias. But, you know, we sort of look at it as like, like government is a luxury, right? It's like, we should have great government. Sure, it's like services for everyone that everyone needs, you know? So so when I talk about government, I'm most often talking about like the service delivery parts. You know, this is the, like, you talked about the DMV earlier. Great example. I don't want to wait for like six hours of DMV. I want a good service. I want to get in and I want to get out, right? So there is like that that trust or that that reputation or that engagement side of things, but what government usually can measure they, they can measure very well because they usually do these things at high scale is service cycle time, cost of service transaction, and satisfaction with that service transaction. Right? Those are very measurable things, and you can build KPIs around that. So you might say like, so here, here's an example. We uh, was working with uh, one of my government clients up here in Canada, the city of Edmonton. It's where I actually live here. So they're one of our bigger clients. Um, and they were looking at their call center services. They would say, you know, they have a 311 call center. And they did the now, and these are, you know, unionized workforce. They got to have like, you know, all the like the, like the office and the, you know, the, the, the equipment and, you know, everything to protect privacy and the security of that system. So it's, 
it's a call contact center like you would have for any retailer, but it's managed inside of the city and they're experts. And, you know, if you need to know what time does a library open or whatever, you can call this 311 call center and get information if you can't find it elsewhere. So they did the analysis and they said every call costs us $10 and 50 cents. Right. That, that's their actual cost per transaction because they figured it across the day and the total calls. So they said, if we can figure out how to reduce that call um, cost, we can either take more calls or we could divert tax dollars to do other things. You know, so they gave us this challenge of like, how could you automate call center? So we did some really cool stuff with machine learning and sort of like some some AI technology. And, you know, people like chatbots like, oh, they're magical. I'm like, yeah. It can feel magical if you do a lot of really good design work on them, right? And you think really mm -hmm. careful, you execute the technology really well. You can make some magical things happen. When we got to the end of that, you know, they had a couple of big service. They were like a new way to dispose of your garbage was coming and a new, they were replanning all the transit routes. So they were expecting huge volumes of communication. People to be calling because my bus isn't my bus anymore. Well, how do I get where I'm going? I don't know how to put recycles in this new bin. Like what can I compost versus can I compost a pizza box? Just lots of simple questions that people are going to need. So they're testing this huge volume. So you put that AI um, technology in front of the call center, in front of the website, in front of SMS. And we were able to deliver for those simple transactions. And some things you want to offboard to a human, like humans are good at things and humans should do the things that humans are uniquely good at. Machines should do the things machines are uniquely good at. So we were to take that cost per call down to 10 cents, right? Mm -hmm. Now that's, a, that's like, like that, the mayor pays attention to that. Like we took something that cost us $10 per instance, and now it costs us 10 cents per instance. And we can do more and we reduced our load on the call center. And, you know, people are happier because they get what they need right away. So you can measure government services in a really practical way. And I think that's where it gets really exciting. There was a, there was a UK study um, where they, they looked at booking a driver's test, right? Mm -hmm. Hundreds of thousands of, of 16 year olds in the UK all want to get their driver's license every year. Um, so you got to book a test and that means you got to call in, you got to schedule, you got to book, a, a you know, all, all of these, these folks. And they, they looked at, you know, like what happens if you call in to book a test? Well, here it's, it is going to cost about 12 to $13 per service transaction. That's just to book the appointment, not even to deliver the appointment. Now, if people mail in, we can do it a little more efficiently. Like it's not the same kind of real time. We don't need someone on the phone. We can be a little more asynchronous. We can measure it out. So those transactions cost about $5 per for someone to receive a letter, open it, book your appointment, send you a letter back. That's a pretty quick thing. When they got it finally, you know, and UK was an early leader in digital government. They did this before most other folks. They'd be like, we need to be design forward, we need to be user forward, we need to be user citizen centric design services, right? Let's let's learn from like the, the best software companies and let's build services the way they do. They got that service transaction down to like a quarter, right? Wow. You know, so suddenly you're being more responsible, like, is it good to, that it's ten dollars? I guess you're employing civil servants. You know that's that's good. But like, there's probably a lot of other things you could do than answer the phone to book a driver's test to deliver value, right? Like they can. You know, it's not about necessarily even reducing that cost. It's what are the other important problems in our society government could be solving for people so that we have a more educated, healthy, productive society because that's good for the economy. Um, and so government can just play this whole different role when you take these big, messy, expensive services where they, you know, like you said, paper and they, this old school way of doing things, you know, they're just a radically different way to do it. And digital gives us new possibilities for how to do that. So I'm from New York City, right? Yeah. And I can tell you, I've, I've lived here all my life, you know. Yeah. And one of the biggest pivots that I saw the government actually make was actually investment in digital government, Right. Yeah. And I think I, I will give I know that there, there are different types of people. Pol I don't play politics at all. So uh, what I saw was when like Mayor Bloomberg came into the office because of his yeah. tech background and everything. He I think he was one of the first people to actually have a CIO or CTO for the for the city of New York. City of New That's York is New York City is gigantic place, you know. So yeah. and, and I saw all these uh, services being delivered through. Uh, NYC.gov, and then you have mm -hmm. access to data. You can you can book services. You can find out yep. about different things. Combination. You mentioned 311. 311 became a pretty normal thing. Any any question you had, you, you could pick it up and have a call, or better yet, you can. And even when you call them, they say, "Just go to NYC.gov. It has yep. you know." To, and most people hang up and they just go go to the website because it's yep. more convenient for them to do their own self research, unless they want to talk to a human being because there is a. There's a there, there's that need for some 
think that the, the website didn't answer, you know? Yeah. So what are your thoughts about New York City and where, where New York City is with NYC.gov and, and 311 and all of these kind of services uh, that, that this, the city provides to its citizens? Well, I think New York is, is, is a global leader in this. New York did things early and they had a chief digital officer. And I, it's going to be embarrassing that I'm going to forget her name because I've read a lot of what she's written. She's brilliant. Um, and it's just I haven't thought about her in a couple of years. Um, so the pandemic bumped facts out of my brain. I should have had this one research. <laughs> I want to say Hillary somebody and I, this will come to me. I will look this up. Okay. Um, she's worth pursuing because so she was working for Bloomberg. Right. Um, and the mindset they had in New York was, look, we're New York City. The biggest and best tech companies have, if not head offices here, at least big, important offices, like like with smart people in those offices. We have some of the best startups in here where, you know, we are New York City. We are where the world comes to do business, right? So they said, we're not going to go look at other governments because, frankly, we're ahead of everybody and we want to stay ahead of everybody. So we're not going to go look at that. We're going to do crowdsourcing from entrepreneurs, from technologists, from industry leaders, we're going to talk to folks about what does a modern digital organization look like? How do you do this? And then we're going to hire the best delivery organizations to create the most usable designs, the most you know human-centric, human-friendly platforms. We're going to do this right based on the best advice we can get from the entire industry. And I think that's partly why New York is, you know, also it's New York. You can you have the best and brightest right there, you know, living inside the city walls, right? So you know, you have access to these people, but also it's a very New York way to do things. I was, I was super inspired by that, you know, to be government being entrepreneurial. I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. You don't you don't often get to do that. But New York is being New York and, and with good leadership, too. Right. Because, you, you know, you brought up a little bit of politics, and you know, like, sure. Yeah. Like you want your people to and your ideas to lead. And that's sort of the, the nature of politics. You know, so people battle for who's in charge. But good digital outcomes require good leadership. Because, you know, we all think about that, you know, the office space, you know, a, a movie where, where like the guy just is his stapler. They keep moving his stapler. He's like, stop moving my stapler. <laughs> yeah. you know, like, the red stapler. And, and not to say, I don't mean to compare government employees to the dude from office space who, who wants his red stapler on his desk. Right. I'll just say all of us have a little bit of that person in them. Right. We just like our stuff. We've learned how to do our job. We just got good at it. We learned what's safe, what's socially safe in our workspace. You start making big change. And, oh, people want their stapler back where it was really fast, you know, and all kinds of people up and down the organization. So you need alignment. You need leadership that's strong. You need strategy. And I, and I just one of the things that I think Bloomberg should be celebrated for just as a leader, period, was he created an environment where that great digital work could happen. I think that's really cool, too. Yeah. I mean, it starts at the top, right? If yep. the top is... Uh, you know, responsible, accountable, and, you know, th those are the basic stuff, right? If, yeah. if they take on that responsibility to say, you know what, I'm going to take New York City, I'm going to transform it into all of these services will be digitally available so that people yeah. have no issue having access to, because there are so many government organizations. I mean, I've lived here all my life. I hear yeah. about an organization called like, how long they've been around? 200 yeah. years? How, yeah. how, how come I'm hearing about this for the first time in my life? You know, uh, yeah. it's not that they didn't exist. It's just because I it, I never came across them at all. Right. Yeah. You, you don't know if if uh, such a service exists. I mean, typically, you know, when you think about it's like in, in, in any society, it's the people who have the least um, means. Right. Need to yeah. have the most access. They need to have most access to those kind of services. Right. Whether I'm not talking about just poverty and, and low yeah. income, I'm talking about people who need uh, mental health helps, disabilities, yeah. other types of things like that, that they need to have access to certain types of services or yeah. at least to someone to talk to so that they can say, oh, uh, we don't do that. But there are other uh, private organizations that do it. And here's a here's a list of them. Go, you can go and contact them, you know. Oh, great. Yeah. I have somewhere to go to for for the needs that I have, you know. Yeah. I, one, one of the things I like to say is that, that government manages the floor below which we won't let our neighbors sink in society. Right. Mm. So this is the, like just from a human dignity perspective, like you need a certain level of just service and, 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 and well-being and, you know, people need to eat. They need to sleep like they're just basic human needs we need to take care of. And government, in addition, again, like like policy and enforcement, like one of the things government 
does for our society is make sure that we take care of our neighbors at at least a minimum level, right? To say like, you know, cer certain things that's up to you, but these are things that we've agreed are, are basic rights in our society that people should have access to. I think that's that's a really challenging space to be in though, right? You know, so, you know, how, how do you do that? You know, and we all have a lot of opinions about like where we dial that and what is what is good enough, you know, because that's, that's, that's the political side of things, right? They, they can fight that out. We'll let the politicians have those conversations. But, you know, one of the cool things about government, too, is, there's, you know, you talked about this, you know, these organizations you never heard of. So government has a lot to do with getting born and dying. You only ever do those things once. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, but, uh, you know, so like, like, how do you know, you know, you get to these major life events like, oh, I am getting married. It's my first time getting married. Maybe it's my only time getting married, you know, so. Do I need to register? I need to let people know. I need to, you know, this is official. There's like a something has to go to city hall or to the to the regional government, to a state or a province up here in Canada, you know. So these you have these big moments of interaction with government around some of your most major life events. A, an elderly parent is going into hospice, and you need to prepare for end of life. And what do I do? It's going to involve a lot of interaction with government departments at a time where you're probably at your worst self, right? That's probably. Mm -hmm. You know, it's even if you're getting married and it's a joyful thing, you know, the last thing you want to deal with is the certificate <laughs> and the, the registering it, at, you know, at a government office. And yet we do need a record of that because that will be important in your future. Right. In terms of how you access benefits and how, you know, the legal system treats you, et cetera. So, you know, we we come to government at these major life moments and we need so much from them for a very short period of time. So again, like you think back to a product company, you know, product companies are about like, like, how do we talk, you know, a daily engagement? How do we, you know, government is like, I have a very high need in a very short time span is very, very, very important to me for joyful or sorrowful reasons, wherever you are on that spectrum. And I need help, right? So it, it's sort of your worst self as a human, you're most distracted by other things and you need something deeply. And that's, those are the moments we come to government. And I think that's why usability and accessibility and, and you know, like, digital services where you can do it in your time and you know 11 at night when you finally get the kids to bed when you finally have a minute to sit down and figure like a how do i apply for this thing that I need? you know that's the moment and you got the tv on in the background and you know dishes need to get done and you need to focus and get something complicated done and, and I, I think those moments are, are you know why we need great 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 government digital services you know when you um you, you mentioned about stressful times. I mean, one of the things yeah. I think stressful with certain government agencies, you know, is that right off the bat, as soon as you need any kind of services from them, you start stressing out, right? You're a 16-year-old. You want to get your driver's yeah. license. You're stressed out. You don't want to go to the DMV, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I mean, at least if, if some of those services were available digitally, that you could at least have some control over that, right? It's already yeah. that life event uh, is... It is stressful getting a passport, you know, getting uh, getting your deed to your to your property or something like yeah. that. You know, those those yeah. events are already stressful on top of it. Now, if you go and uh, spend a whole day, which typically was pretty a regular thing or several days chasing yeah. something uh, because there were no digital access like pre-1995. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and after 1995, Paul Bailos is born and he digitizes the, con you know, all these governments, you know, I but before that, that, you would waste yeah. a lot of time and, and yeah. you would be stressed out. And you, first of all, you're handling a stressful situation, yeah. but on top of it, you're getting stressed out because you don't know the process. I mean, if there yeah. was an infographic on NYC.gov said, oh, if you want to achieve this, here we go. These are the five steps you need to go through. I'm going yep. to educate myself and go like, okay, this is how I'm going to go through this process. I'm on step one or step five, or, you know, there are exceptions here. It, it explains everything to me. Great. And now I know walking in what I'm, what am I getting in myself into? If yep. I, if I didn't, I'm talking about before 1995, you're already stressed out because you don't know what yep. it is. And then you get to that person uh, behind the window and you talk to them. I, and then the person has only this much time to help you, not their yep. fault. They just yeah. have to handle the thousand people that are standing behind you also. Yeah. And and the other thing that's true about government is like, can you think of like, aside from maybe going to the library or, you know, like a public library, et cetera, you know, or a public pool, you know, but think about like when you have to interact with government on the bureaucracy side, would you ever choose to do that? No. 
but you must do that, right? If you want to drive Based a car, you need. must have a driver's license. Yeah. No one chooses to get a driver's license. It would just rather get in my car and drive it. That's the thing that I want is to get from here to where I'm going. And when you're 16, it's really fun to drive a car later than you just yeah. live with traffic and we all resent driving cars later, you know, but you know, when you're 16, you want the car, you want the hands on the steering wheel. You want to take your friends. You want to pick up whoever you're attracted to and take them on a ride, right? Like all the joyful things about getting into a car. Um, and you got to go through the hurdle of like book a test, take the test, learn the material, pass, fail, get the ID printed, get the photo done. No one wants to do that. So everybody who comes to government is in some state of, Stress. resistance i guess you know stress yeah. hostility i don't know anything from just this is frustrating right up to a i'm furious that i have to do this thing in order to get the thing that i really want which is the bathroom renovation done or my driver's license or to get married you know um so yeah like anywhere we can reduce those barriers and what we've seen time and time again is when you get people happier you know, there's, there's a Canadian think tank up here that, that was based in Canada. They're called the Institute for Citizen-Centered Services. And, of course, it's also in French up here in Canada because we're, we're bilingual. Um, and I always forget the French version. I, I really have to learn that. <laughs> but they did this big, like, they've been doing research on, like, government services for decades. And they come down to a pretty simple formula, which makes a good government service, you know. And they said, A, fast. B, easy to use. C, single channel. I can get everything I need through one channel. Like if I go in person, I can get it all done there. If I call on the phone, I can get it all done there. But you think that recipe of fast, easy, and one channel, digital is our best avenue when we get it right. You know, and government doesn't always get digital right. It's easy to get digital wrong. It's easy for anybody to get digital wrong. But when you get it right, you can have that magical experience. And then you can just have people, we don't need people to be delighted with government services. We need them to be satisfied. It's this thing you must solve do. their problem. You know, whatever problem that. that they're trying to solve, it's solved. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's in the UK where they got it down to like, if you have, if you're just, you have a job, your taxes come off your paycheck, it's all remitted automatically, everything's done, you don't have anything complicated, weird dependents or other tax deductions. Your, your taxes are texted to you, it says, hey, we've calculated this. Do you accept it? And you can say, looks good. And you don't fill out any forms. They're just like, we have all your info. If you, you know, you only have to fill in the forms if you want to dispute all the income you made, all the deductions you had, and you know, the, any refund or, or tax owing debt. Otherwise, you can just mm. text Y. And you're you you're done. You're done. Isn't that a nice <laughs> service, right? You know, why do if I have nothing complex going on in my taxes, I'm just I have a job. I'm happy to pay you whatever percentage I'm, I'm due. I just don't want to do the paperwork. Why, why would you have to? Because the government should have all that data available. They just historically haven't been very I good. I mean, every paycheck paper goes, paper. every paycheck data goes anyways, you know? Well, yeah. Yeah. They your your, your employer is already submitting all that data. So why do you have yeah. to, you know, any unless you yeah. have like, even if you have like three jobs, it doesn't matter. Your employers yeah. are sending all that stuff anyways, you know? Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So. I mean, we're talking about these uh, gigantic places, right? United States, yeah. New York City, uh, Canada, yeah. UK. But you and I know that there is another country that has done a fabulous job. And I want to actually send a shout out to, the, I, I don't know the person, by the way, I watch his channel just, just because I find his content interesting because I don't know anything about that topic. The YouTube channel is called uh, Nomad Capitalist. I find it phenomenal because I... He talks about a topic I have no idea, you know. Yeah. So to me, I'm a sponge. I just want to learn more, you know. So there he mentioned a country about, you know, because he talks about getting residency and citizenships and, and getting a second citizenships and passports and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. So I, I just find the topic fascinating. So I just I just want to learn from that facet for that fascination. And in one of his episodes, he was talking about or several of his episodes, he has talked about the country of Estonia. Estonia is the leader because I'm from America. Let's yeah. say, let's can you can you for because you're Canadian and your geography yeah. is much better. Where yeah. is Estonia situated for my American audience? And then and then let's go d deep dive into the digital aspect of Estonia. So, Estonia, you know, if you sort of think of like the map of Europe and you've got and and so we're, we're recording this in, on in October of 2022 when. Russia is on everybody's mind and the Ukraine is on everybody's mind right now. Wherever you stand on it, it's that's part of the, the map. You probably have an image of it, right? 
So you take Russia and you take the Ukraine. I, mean, I might be myriad here, so excuse me if I'm let my left, right, or, or flip for you. But like you the Ukraine, and then Estonia is just right on the Baltic Sea. There, like race right, right, they're right there, and they're they're small, and they were a former Soviet republic. There are only about 1.2, 1.3 million people in Estonia. I say only. There are there are 1.2 wonderful humans in Estonia, right? That's a, that's a wonderful number of Estonians, but um, when they left the Soviet uh, Union, they were small, they were agile, they didn't have a lot of computer systems, and it kind of happened at the beginning of the digital age. And they had some really great leadership at that point, and they said, let's be a digital government. And no one knew what it meant at that point. But because they were a little small, they were a little out of the way, they did some interesting things for over a decade before people started to notice. And they started with digital identity. And we say, look, you know, we talk about like a digital twin or like that digital version of myself. What what are all the digital artifacts, my bank accounts and my social security numbers and all, all these things that form the digital version of me. But they were like, we, we ought to be real about this. We actually want to have a digital identity that is secure, that is robust. And, you know, I think when a lot of people talk about digital identity, it's like, oh, I can use I can use Facebook to sign into things. Right. Oh, that's single sign on that's system access. Right. So. Access management is not the problem they were trying to solve. Identity management is the problem they're trying to solve. So here's what's cool about what you can do in Estonia. If you are a citizen, you get to choose who can see your data. You can audit if somebody in government has looked at my income. Who, why did they do that? I can ask questions about it. Everything about your digital view. And so one of the great fears is we give our digital identity to government. What else will they do with that information? In Estonia, they're like it is transparent to all stakeholders. You know, you can't look at citizen data or use citizen data in a way that you don't make that transparent to citizens. So some of the things people are just like now getting their heads around like crypto and like distributed ledgers and auditability and you can't corrupt it. You, you know, Estonia has been doing that with digital ID for like well over two decades. Wow. And they have this open road platform where everything can wire up. It's so good. The banking sector said, we'll use that. It's better than what we can have. Private sector said, we'll use that. And then based on that foundation of identity and being able to absolutely concrete say who you are, they started to digitize their entire legislative process. So like the prime minister of Estonia signs, I think it's prime minister, not president. Again, I'll, I should double check that. Someone double check that. I might be wrong. Prime, I'll say prime minister and, and, and apologies if I got that wrong. Prime minister of Estonia uses an iPad to, to like enact legislation. And then it becomes a digital record. And this is where it comes, like history comes to today. So this is this beautiful thing that Estonia talks about. They talk about digital embassies. Because as a former Soviet Republic, and again, lots of different people who might watch this might have a different opinion on this. However, they have to be thinking today. And in fact, they've publicly been talking about, well, Russia is encroaching on Ukraine, right? Has sent armed forces into Ukraine. And they're small and they're right on the border. Like you can, you can sort of on a map, you can sort of like it's it's about an inch to Moscow from or where Estonia, Tallinn in, in, in Estonia is, you know, and so it's, they're close. So they're very aware of this. So their, their model is we have a digital emb embassy in London. If we have a threat to our sovereignty, we can back our entire society up. Every contract, every law, every marriage, every wow. birth, every death, every interaction with government, every permit for building, like the entire government is a digital artifact. They can back up to London. And then they say, when we restore our sovereignty, we can restore our government from a backup. Wow. It's just not, a concept, not, you know? Yeah, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. That's radically yeah. digital government. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of phenomenal when you, when you kind of think about that. Like, if you come across uh, or have spoken to anyone that's a refugee, from from a, whether it's Ukraine, yep. Afghanistan, yep. Iraq, any anywhere, right? One of the biggest thing, the challenges that they have is, oh, I used to own property, oh, before the war, right? Yep. I had yep. three buildings, I had a farm, I had this company, yep. and the thing is now, you know, whoever took it over, whatever, because you're not there anymore, they took the yep. thing over, and then you know, but that's your property. That's your property. You paid for it. Your family paid for it for generations. If you don't That's have records, your property, you know, if you don't have records, it's it's up to who who has the most power in that situation, which if there's an occupying force is not going to be you. Yep. Or or yeah. even even the government that takes yeah. over might 
might say might not honor your ownership yeah. of uh, even though you may show that look i own this property for 400 years yeah, yeah but the person who owns it now but bought it from 10 people from 10 different people in a chain yeah. right and yeah. then it's not their fault you know they thought that they were buying it from the proper owner of the person but even yeah. that person was not the owner it was like 10 back the, there was a war and then they the people left, left and somebody just said oh you know what i'm going to squat this place and i'm going to sell it you know yeah 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 yeah, yeah. uh when, when uh I was just curious, like, you know, you start with one one uh, government right now. You're you're having some success in your agency because I want to talk to you about your entrepreneurship a little bit, too. Yeah. Right now you go and now you have three other clients. There are three other government org organizations. Were they all in Canada or did you start expanding out immediately into some U.S. governments, too? So we we tend to work, you know, the, the federal governments are massive. You sort of said, hey, you know, like we, we talk about these great big stories and massive, but federal governments don't often need as much help from outside, right? So we, we sort of identified quickly, like the business model for us is in smaller organizations. And the good news is there are more small organizations than large organizations. So you would have like, like they call them the ABCs, right? So you got like a regional government, like a state or a, or a Canadian province, and then they'll have agencies, boards, and corporations. So like an example of a corporation that, that a lot of folks in the U.S. would understand would be a water utility. You know, we are responsible for water quality and we are a arm's length organization. We have our own CEO. We have our own our executive director. We have our own management staff, our own IT department. And we operate water on behalf of the city. Right. So the, the governments will sort of go, yeah, this line of business, it's unique enough. We can silo it. We can put a wrapper around it. It's its own organization. We can report on profit loss. We can. You know, they can build good management practices and they can manage a resource for us. And you will see that all across governments, these agencies, boards and commissions. You might have like a, a board of education in a, in a region. We're responsible for the asset of education in our community or the service of education in our community. Um, and so that's the target market we go after is those types of organizations, municipalities, cities, you know, um, because they have all the same problems of government, but they don't have the scale and the reach and the sort of the budgets necessarily to do all that work. And so they need partners like us that can come and help them walk through the path and, and figure out how to do. And we take some of the work and design build and we do a lot of managed services. We take stuff into cloud and manage the security. I would say government, you know, and I th you know, unions are, are, are very synonymous with, with government employees, right? Like unionized mm -hmm. say like, look, we need to protect workers nine to five. Again, lots of opinions and unions. But they do get a high correlation with government. What's hard to do is when a server goes down at 2 a.m., get somebody to unionize to get out of bed and go fix it without a lot of, you know, and if it happens a lot, you know, that's hard to do. So companies like mine, our business model is we can solve for that, right? You know, we're, we're, we're a little more agile. We have different ways of compensating people. We have different tools available to us. So we can do that 24-7 management and, moder and monitoring these platforms and security updates and patching and hot fixes and intrusion detection, all those things. So we take care of a lot of those 24 seven services for government when government isn't always designed to run in a 24 seven modality, it's sort of designed, you know, the more bureaucratic parts of government bureaucracy is the office, right? And it's the office mm -hmm. hours and it's the nine to five. So that's, that's part of our partnership. So we work alongside governments to do that stuff. Um, but we stay mostly in Canada, but we have a couple of clients down in the U S like we do work with a couple of, uh, you know, the DC, um, uh, attorney general's office we've done some interesting stuff for them around like like chat bots and and things so yeah we do have some clients down in the u.s but it's also true as a canadian company that uh government likes to buy local they like you know it's tax dollars right so it just looks better if like if you're in new york can we give this to a new york company right that's mm. actually part of the evaluation usually it's better to give it to people in our own community and keep our tax dollars here growing businesses in our community so at a strategic level, one of the things we've been doing is slowly pivoting from being just a services company where we come in and design and build and manage things to more of a platform company where we actually have platforms where we can deliver and we can do things more quickly and more repeatedly on these platforms because a lot of government needs the same types of thing. You know, we sort of say we, we create the Lego blocks they can use to quickly build things, um, uh, build services and interfaces and, 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 and applications and things. Um, so we're looking at a channel strategy to say, hey, when, when we do really want to grow into the U.S., government's going to want to buy from a U.S. company, but that U.S. company may not want to re-engineer and redevelop the entire platform that they use to deliver government. 
uh, okay. government services, government information. So we would partner with those organizations and say, look, we'll take care of the platform. You know, we'll, we'll operate this thing for you because you like regional agency in the Pacific Northwest or, you know, down in the Southwest of the U.S., wherever you are, you know, you've got local business, you've got local network, local reach, local relationships. We'll do the platform. You grow your services business. So that's our model for how we're planning to enter new markets. And that lets us go, like, if you want to go to France, France is on the early stages of digital modernization. Lots of interesting things happening there. They're going to want a French company speaking in the French language with all the French cultural understanding and all the understanding of history and context, probably come in and do that service modernization work. Mm -hmm. We can still be quietly in the background supporting their platform. So when... Uh... COVID hits, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Pandemic hits. Yeah. All the all the governments in the world are in a tailspin, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm from New York, and New York City actually is where I live. Yeah. Uh, became the center of the universe basically when it came to the pandemic, right? Before that, you yeah. would he hear about Wuhan and China, and on the news yeah. you would hear that yeah. there's this disease that's coming, but yeah. it got to New York because he, well, New York is a hub, right? JFK. Yeah. Every plane in the world land, lands there, right? Yeah. So whatever you're carrying, not just your luggage, you're sneezing, you yeah. have any kind of disease, you're bringing that to New York, you know? Yeah. So uh, that hits the world. Uh, at first, New York goes into complete lockdown. Uh, and then uh, other, other governments start learning, like California and so on and so forth. A lot of governments starts going into lockdown. I believe that a lot of evolution, technology evolution also happened oh, yeah. during that period because you couldn't get out of your house. You could not go to the yeah. courts. You could not go to the department of whatever, right? That, yeah. that, that provided that service. You had to do it through phone. You had to do it through Zoom. You had to do it through all these kind of things. I mean, even though we say these things very casually, like, oh, you know what? Students can learn from home. Great. We have students who barely get food at in yeah. their home they come to school to actually eat right yeah yeah how do you deliver that service to them in their home let alone expecting them not everybody has an ipad or, or a laptop right maybe maybe that entire family has one phone that smartphone that mom or dad carries that's it that's the only yeah. bit of tech you have maybe there is one tv that's it so we went through a tremendous amount of evolution from your perspective, because you lived it from a government's perspective, for government's POV, how did that go? So that you, you touched on two things that I think are the most important themes here. And, and it isn't actually the thing you, I think that you first said, which is technology modernization, right? So all the technology government is using today to do digital service existed before the pandemic. The one big change that happened in government was culture change, right? Because government said, oh, well, we can't use the, you know, a lot of folks said, well, we can't use cloud systems because we're accountable to manage privacy. And if we hand that off to another organization to do on our behalf, we've lost our chain of stewardship. We're no longer fully accountable. Now we're co-accountable with this private sector organization and their interests might not be aligned to ours. Their mandate may not be aligned to ours, right? So, so there's a fear of how do we build these partnerships with these external organizations? You know, I think Zoom is a company that is, radically different post-pandemic than pre-pandemic. We all had sort of heard of Zoom, but like who has I used to use them for a long time. Actually, yeah. I like them better than like some of the other apps. I don't want to name the other yeah. apps. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, these aren't product placement ads, you know, just sort of talking about things like Zoom became like Kleenex, right? Like, like, like they yeah. just became a brand name, you know, that was just like, or, or let's, let's Zoom about that, right? It became a verb. Yeah, you might be FaceTiming or Google Meet yeah. or WebEx or whatever. It doesn't matter. You're Zooming. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So what happened was, you know, government said, well, our people have to be in offices. We need to keep our documents in the office. We need all the security. We know we have screenings coming in and out. So there's no way we could do business digitally. Right. We couldn't run our operation. We couldn't run these programs for, you know, folks in need or whatever, because we have to take care of their private information. When it became impossible, it was literally impossible to do business in those old ways. Well, I guess we either shut government down or we do it digitally. People do it from home. They do it over Zoom or whatever tool they use. And government changed their culture because they didn't have another choice. I have a friend who's an evolutionary biologist and he's like to say, you know, like we think that evolution is this nice linear thing of the, like these species improve, improve, improve based on I would like more food higher in trees or whatever. He says the way evolution happens is 
a volcano erupts, a meteor hits, a famine occurs, you know, like, like a flood happens and species change because they must, you know, it's more like that, you know, violent, you know, and, and often unpleasant things actually cause most evolution. Um, th that's what it was like for government. So government just was in a tailspin and they just said, we, we have to do this. And what they found at the end of the day was we can do this. And what's happening now is they're going to say, okay, how do we harden these systems? How do we fix our licensing? How do we, you know, how do we do this for a long time now? But nobody in government is saying, okay, quick, everyone back, you know, back to the office, back to paper, back to, they've realized we can do this. We can get here. But then there's another theme that is in there that isn't, you know, it's interesting, you know, what is government's mandate here? Again, there will be a lot of opinions on this, but you talk about equity to say, okay, well, great. Now, we've become fully digital. We've got all these great tools. What if you're in a household where there's one phone and you need to do online school, right? And there's three kids. Now, now what is that? So at a society level, you know, and again, like I like to think of these things like they're easy because, you know, from where I say, hey, look at all the tax savings we created by going digital. Our services are less expensive. Let's make sure everyone has access, you know, and maybe access in their home. You know, why, why do we make sure everyone has a good tablet available? or one tablet per kid so we can do online school or online whatever it is you know online community online you know post you know a, a, post you know curricular um, extracurricular sports who knows what you know like like why can't we make more things digital here and and why can't we ensure access for everybody make sure we have good broadband everywhere you know that that, that we're supporting the telecom companies to make sure that the infrastructure is here to deliver this cuz the other thing that happened in the pandemic was the entire internet had been designed around these like hub and spoke where like 90% of things happen in the downtown core and then a little bit of stuff happens in the suburbs and out in rural that turned on its head. You know, the entire hundred yeah, percent of every humanity yeah. was on zoom <laughs> you know? and using high volume, like video and like the, the most like intensive consumption of, of internet capacity in a way that the network was never designed to handle. So these are, some they of got the bored, they got on better. Netflix, they got on YouTube, they got on Hulu yeah. or whatever online Absolutely. services, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Online school. And it was, online school was a hard cultural change. You know, I, my kid was in kindergarten when the pandemic started. She's eight now. Right. So, um, getting, trying to do kindergarten online, that was a courageous patient teacher. She was a saint. <laughs> so she deserves, I mean, some I kids, some kids, you know, some kids that were born during COVID, you know, 2020, 2021, yeah. they did not see humanity. They saw yeah. masks, yeah. everybody with masks. Yeah. So when they didn't have a mask, they don't know what to do with those people. And, and they have not, and some, some kids did not even have social skills yeah. because they were not interacting in a playground or playing with other kids and stuff because yeah. of re restrictions of COVID, you know? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's been, it's been a radical shift to our entire society and our entire culture. And there's the entire spectrum of emotions about it, right? Everything from rage to gratitude, you know, and people have a lot of feelings about it. And we're going to be unpacking this for decades, I bet decades so paul you know it has been fabulous having you on the show yeah. and dropping all this amazing knowledge uh, i want to ask you your number one biggest challenge and how to solve it if you're a government if you want to go through a digital transformation you're one hundred thousand dollar because we're talking about government let's up it yeah. to one million dollars you know there you expert yeah. insight into biggest challenge and how to solve it uh, that you, you want to leave the audience with so the the biggest challenge for government is in the old world day government was a procurement expert a legal expert a contract management expert they had people that would buy stuff outside digital is government making their own stuff government is more like a software company today than they ever have been because in-house you have prototypers and field researchers and user experience experts and content strategists front developers back-end developers cloud engineers government has gone from buying that stuff off the shelf, like a product, like I need to buy some concrete, please, for my building to, we're going to have to make this stuff ourselves and support it ourselves. So the biggest challenge government's going to have in the next 10 years, especially because 2027 is peak boomer exiting the workforce. That is the year where the wave crests. We're going to have the largest retirements we've ever seen. It's already starting to happen. How are you going to find the people to do the work? That is the number one question that government should be asking themselves immediately and urgently. What do we need to change about our culture, about our toolkit, about our technology, about the way we make decisions, about the way we assign and execute work and the way we do procurement? 
so that we can manage the workforce that we need to make really good digital stuff, the kind of things citizens would prefer to use and that won't create rage, you know, like that'll give good experiences and that'll create the maximum equity. So we can get the most people doing things digitally because it's the fastest, the easiest, and it's the one channel that people prefer to use. And when you get it right, it's the lowest cost way to deliver many, not all, but many government services. Well said, Paul. Thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate you being here and dropping all this amazing knowledge. Hey, Sabir, this is great. It's, it's, I like talking to somebody who comes from a marketing background on government because you often you think those are as far apart as you can get. I'm like, no, government's doing the same kind of hard work that a Facebook or a Google or any of those other big brand name you know, software companies are all the startups you know, and the VC driven stuff. Government is right in there and they're trying to get it right too. It is, I think it's, there's really innovative, interesting stuff happening inside of government these days. Well said. And thank you, live audience, for joining us live. And uh, if you're catching this on a recording, uh, thank you for that too. And uh, you know, we have many other guests coming up, expert guests like Paul, uh, talking about their expertise and, and their subjects. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Thanks, everyone.